and welcome to our monthly meeting. Uh, my name is Rocky Milburn. I'm the chair of the Tampa Bay Sierra Club, as well as the Tampa Bay ICO, the, our youth organization. Um, we have uh, we do these meetings the second two, second Wednesday of every month. We're happy to hear. I uh, introduce a few of our board people. We've got Don Cruz, a former board member. Now he was just recently reelected. So Don, welcome. And Bonnie knew it, our program chair. We'll come back to her and sitting beside her, kind of can't see him as Michael knew it. Yeah, he'll be here in a minute. <laughs> One of our XCOM members. Uh, Kathy Crosby is our secretary. Um, Dr. Norman and Outings leader, Shirley. She's got a different, she's got her name, I'm sure. She didn't, is our outings chair. Um, let's see who else. Ed Chendell is an outings leader and a trainer at outings and first aid trainer, as well as Shirley. Um, Phil Compton, one of our leaders on the conservation, Virginia Overstreet. She's uh, with Native Plant. So, and Rob Jordan just joined us. He is our communications guy on the executive committee. He's the one that sends all the notices out along with Bonnie about Facebook, Meetup, the website, all that. So he's got a team that's working on that, so. Okay. Well, as you know, tonight's uh, presentation is about how to plant a vegetable garden and it's, uh, it's time. Today would have been a beautiful day to get started. Um, and we have with us Tia Silvasi. And Tia, um, she got her agricultural roots from growing up on her grandparents' farm in Pennsylvania. And she's been working in the horticulture field now for over 30 years. Um, she received her undergraduate degree from the University of Central Florida and her master's degree from the University of Hawaii. Um, Tia manages the Master Gardener Volunteer Program, which probably most of you have heard of. Um, maybe Tia could talk a little bit about that. Um, and she also teaches horticulture classes with the UF IFAS, uh, you know, University of Florida uh, Hillsborough or Extension um, in Hillsborough County. So with that, Tia, go right ahead and tell us how to plant a vegetable garden. Yeah, welcome to Zoom land. Um, thanks so much for having me tonight to talk about plants. I'm a big plant lover. I love all kinds of plants, vegetables, trees, grasses, um, native plants, butterfly plants, flowers. But, um, you know, on my grandma's farm, I really grew up, you know, growing vegetables and fruit trees. And so I love the edibles. And for anybody who's interested in sustainability, you know, having a little bit of something that you can eat at your house, you know, can go a long way. I mean, usually the grocery stores are stocked, but you never know when we get that big hurricane or something and things get wiped out. So, um, I recently transferred to Hillsborough County from Orange County and I'm currently managing the Master Gardener program. And if anybody wants to volunteer and you love talking about plants like me, we have a lot of opportunities for you to get involved. Being affiliated with the University of Florida, you know, we provide science-based information. So we have like the research stations. There's one down in Baum, um, kind of near Waimama. And, you know, they grow strawberries, tomatoes, and the researchers are coming up with the cutting edge recommendations. And then us as extension agents and master gardener volunteers, we bring that information to the public. So it's, it's really a rewarding job. And, you know, the science is always changing. So there's there's a lot to know and evolve. So if you guys can allow me to share my screen, I'll get my presentation started. Now um, at our um, extension yeah. office, we're located in Sefner. We are open for walk-in visitors. So you can come um, Monday through Friday during business hours. And we have a small discovery garden, you know, that features native plants and vegetables. 
that you can walk through and there's some signage for educational. Um, our help desk is open Mondays and Fridays. So if you have a question about, you know, a bug or a fungus or a disease on your plant, you can come in person, bring a sample at that time, or you can send us pictures um, through the email. And if you don't want to come in person, we also have like monthly workshops at our extension center. So um, we are doing hybrid classes right now, you know, welcome to 2023. And so, you know, um, they'll be offered by in-person and by Zoom. All right, so you guys see the screen? All right, great. Well, let's get started. So today I'm going to talk about spring vegetable gardening. And so our vegetable gardening season kind of starts in the winter months, like September, October, and kind of goes until May. And then you have that summer season where you should be a snowbird and go up north or cover your garden and, and solarize or grow some cover crops or something. But right now, like exactly right now is the time to plant your garden. So plant your seeds, you know, start them in little cells bum up, get them in the garden. And it's just a great time of year, you know, before we hit the summer and the, in the rainy season. And so let's get started. Um, first of all, if you want to do a vegetable garden, you want to choose a good site. So most vegetables like full sun, um, you can see in the picture here, this is a raised garden bed and full sun, um, also access to water, Vegetables can be a little demandy, you know, with water needs, especially when you're starting seeds in the ground, you know, they're going to need regular irrigation. Once they get established, especially if you do some mulching, you know, then they can become a little bit more drought tolerant and also accessible. So if you have a kitchen and you like to cook, maybe put the vegetable garden right outside your back door where you can go and harvest a little bit of food and go in and cook it. You know, like here in the picture, we're growing some purple kale. We have some beets and things like kale. You can just go out and cut a leaf or two and bring it in and chop it up for your salad or your stir fry. So it's a great way to improve your health, you know, by incorporating some more vegetables into your diet, like make it easy. So there are a lot of different types of garden beds and don't get hung up on any particular type. Um, most people choose to grow in raised beds because especially if you're in an urban area, it looks neat. It looks pretty. You know, you can easily amend your soil. So you can build it up with lumber or, or recycled lumber or use, you know, rain barrels or whatever. Um, you know, it helps with the pest problems that it's a little bit off the ground. Or if you like to sit down on the edge while you're gardening, so you don't have to bend over so much. Um, the raised part of the garden gives it some good drainage. And one of the cons is that you just have to buy this material like lumber or whatever material to build it. And no material is perfect and lasts forever. So you know, like the pressure treated lumber, it doesn't have the toxic chemicals it did back in the 80s. It's generally considered safe for building, but even, you know, pressure treated or cedar, you know, being in soil and water, it's going to deteriorate over 5, 10, 15 years, and you're going to have to build it again. So, and then you have to fill up the garden, depending how deep you make the raised beds, you know, that could be one or two or more yards of soil. And, Soil, you know, is currently going for around 40 bucks a yard if you have your own pickup truck. So if you build a really big, deep garden bed, that could be five yards of soil, you know, and cost you a couple hundred dollars to fill it up. Um, the more traditional type of garden is the in-ground garden. And, you know, people who have large gardens tend to just do this method because you don't need to buy lumber and you can just top dress, you know, amend with a couple inches of compost and till that in, you know, so you don't need that volume of soil for a small area. 
Um, this is probably the cheapest garden to start. You can even use, you know, recycled logs or old lumber, or if you have like those areca palms or bamboo or something for the borders. And um, this also lends itself really well to planting in row crops and having drip irrigation, which is the most efficient type of irrigation for vegetables. Um, a little bit of cons for the in-ground garden is that, you know, sometimes people don't know where to walk. And so you're walking on the bed, on the roots, maybe more than you would on a raised garden bed. And it's usually a larger area. So weed control can be difficult. And, and that's why we recommend mulching with some straw or pine straw or something. Now, if you live in a small space or say an apartment or a townhome, then you want to do a type of container garden. If you don't have room for a raised bed or in-ground garden, um, when choosing a container, you want to find a more large one because vegetables do like, you know, soil and fertilizer and moisture. So like in these pictures here, these are maybe two to three feet wide by one foot deep. And then they have the res water reservoir in the bottom. You can see on the picture on the left, you know, it has this little black pipe that fills the water to go in on the picture to the right. It has that open spout thing. You can fill the bottom. So it's kind of a self-watering grow container. Um, if, if you don't have a self-watering container, that's okay. But you want to choose like a large pot. Think something like a five-gallon bucket for something like a tomato, you know, that wants to get big and make fruits. If you want to do herbs or something, you can grow those in smaller pots. But um, these grow boxes, you know, the ones that are commercially made are really durable. They're made out of like UV resistant plastic. They might have that self-watering feature. Um, the cons are, you know, they're expensive. One of these might cost like $40 and that's not even with the soil and the plants. And, you know, they're just small, so ideal for small spaces, but you don't want, if you have a huge area, um, you know, containers may not be practical. Um, another thing about container gardening, if you're gardening indoors, I mean, like outdoors in a patio, you might have more shade. And so some shade tolerant vegetables that will be good in these garden boxes would be leafy greens, things like lettuce, Swiss chard kale, because they don't need to flower to produce fruit. Anything that needs to flower, like a tomato or an eggplant or a pepper, you need to have that in more full sun so it can flower and produce those flute fruits. And, and pollination could be an issue too if you have a screened in porch. So another type of garden um, growing thing is these grow bags. And these are super lightweight and portable. And so people like to buy these. They're pretty cheap, you know, just a couple dollars per bag. And then you can fill it up, you know, here like with a mixture of things. And so, um, you know, cheap, lightweight, easy to move, but they don't have, you know, the soil volume and they kind of tend to dry out quickly. They don't have any type of irrigation. So you might want to put a little micro irrigation sprinkler or maybe a saucer underneath to catch the water or something to make sure it doesn't dry out. And then finally, we have our vertical garden. So these are really high tech. And, you know, there's some professional lettuce growers who who use these tower gardens. Um, you know, the benefit is you can grow a lot of plants at one time, which also might be a con too, because you might get like 50 heads of lettuce at one time. And then what are you going to do with those? You know, um, you can also stagger the plantings for multiple harvests. So, you know, plant one row of them this week and then next week, plant another row next week, plant another row. And that way you have lettuce, you know, every day. Um, you might also have to rotate them to get the sunlight. Some of them have wheels on them for rotating. Um, the cons are they're just kind of high maintenance. You know, it's a small area for you to grow the plants. 
um, they're expensive to buy. Something like this might cost two hundred dollars, you know, for the setup. Um, they probably require electricity to run the pump to circulate the water, and then you might have to buy a special water soluble fertilizer instead of just adding some compost or something. And they're not really suitable for large plants. Like you wouldn't want to grow, you know, big tomatoes in here. So it's better for like lettuce bok choy, you know, maybe some herbs, um, small type of leafy green plants do the best. So moving on, like soil preparation is really important for whatever type of garden you want. Vegetables like loose, fluffy, rich soil, they like a lot of organic matter. Um, if you're starting seeds, you will want to break up the clumps. I have a little video here. Let's see if it works. So you can use a pitchfork, a little tool like this, you know, and just get in, fluff up the soil. You can do it with a shovel too. Um, and we always recommend to get a soil pH test because you want to be in that range of 5.5 to 7.0 for optimal growth of your vegetables. We do that test at our extension office. It is $3 per sample. So bring in your samples, you know, in a little Ziploc baggie, like one cup of soil um, anytime during the week, Monday through Friday, and we can take them for you. So you just need some real basic tools to garden, like a shovel or a pitchfork, um, you know, so just make sure you have a good tool because that will be important. And so here is, you know, the soil. The soil is very important because vegetables generally like rich kind of loamy soil. So you might have the picture on the left, which is kind of a poor sandy soil, not much nutrient, not much organic matter. And then the picture on the right, that's probably what kind of soil you wish you had, more of like a loam, a rich loam with some organic matter. And that organic matter is going to add some microbial activity, like the beneficial um, bacteria and fungi. It will add um, improved like nutrient holding capacity. So to reduce the nitrogen leaching, you know, by holding the nutrients onto the soil. And it will also help with soil moisture, like keeping your soil moist and ideal for like seed germination, whereas the sandy soil, it won't hold the moisture as good. So just always adding organic matter. Um, every time you prepare the bed, you know, definitely once in the spring and once in the fall for beginners. So next, right plant, right place. So in your garden design, um, we are in the Northern hemisphere. So think about the orientation and this goes with landscape design too. The tallest plants, you know, you want in the North. So if you're gonna do a trellis and grow some pole beans up there or whatever, you know, plant that um, in the North side. And then um, the rows, you know, some people do rows like East to West, um, and then the plant spacing, but there's a couple different ways to do this. Like if you've ever learned about square foot gardening or biointensive gardening, so commercial like farms, because they have tractors, you know, they have large rows, but at a home garden, you don't need, you know, those large rows because we're not gardening with tractors. You just need the row like pictured here big enough so you can reach across and get to the plants in the middle from each side. So more like a four foot type of bed that is more biointensive. So you have your plants, you know, kind of staggered in rows in between there with only maybe a foot or two between plants. And so that will save you a lot of space because we want to maximize what we're going to plant in this garden area here. And then crop rotation, you don't want to keep planting the same thing. We want to rotate by plant families. So rotate like a legume with something in the Solanaceae family or the um, squash family. And that will help keep the pests and disease and help with your plant nutrition. So the other thing is the right plant in the right time. And so here we recommend the UF IFAS, um, Florida Vegetable Gardening Guide, 
And um, I think Virginia was going to put a link in the chat for this for me. You can also scan this with your smartphone and get the QR code because this is kind of like the Bible of vegetable gardening. It tells you the best varieties to plant for Florida, um, which are not always up to date, but also the planting times. It has a whole chart with the planting times, and this is available in English and in Spanish. So for Central Florida, we kind of say that our last frost date is February 15th. Sometimes we get a fluke frost in March. Sometimes we don't get any frost at all. So um, this is kind of our target planting date, February 15th, you know, to put things outdoors. And then if we do get a frost, you're going to have to cover everything or just let it fend for itself. Um, you know, you can start earlier than that, like if you have a greenhouse to start seeds indoors or, you know, if during the summertime, if you have some type of shade house or irrigation to keep things cool, then that can help too. But again, like the spring season is like February, March, April, May. Once we get into the summer rains in June, then we get a lot more pest and disease problems. So here's an example table out of that um, Florida Vegetable Gardening Guide. And what you want to look at here is the planting dates for Central Florida, assuming that you're in the Tampa or Central Florida area. Um, so something, for example, bush beans, you know, we can plant these starting in February all the way through April. Um, January, you know, we might get a freeze and then they'll get nipped. April, it starts to get more hotter and, and drier. And, you know, depending on the variety, they may or might, may not do that good. And so then you can look at other things like the plant spacing, you know, how deep you want to plant it. It has how easy is it to transplant the seeds. You know, something like arugula is very easy, like the number one for easy. Beans are harder. We usually direct sow the beans, so it has a three. And it also has a plant family, which I mentioned the crop rotation thing. So you want to rotate, you know, once bean family and then switch it up, something different, beans, corn, you know, something cabbage and keep it um, rotating in your garden. So UF IFAS also has these handy infographics for each month and you can, um, you know, scan this with your smartphone here or Google like edibles to plant um, UF IFAS infographics and it will show you everything to plant in every month. And again, we want to look at the central column here. And so they're kind of in three categories. One, easily survives transplanting. So those are the things that you could start in flats. Um, transplant carefully, you know, be more careful and then direct. So the seeds like beans, carrots, like beans, large seeds, carrots, root crops, um, those are all things that are good just to direct sow directly into your garden bed. Another tip is to use Florida varieties. So if you've heard of the Seminole pumpkin or the Everglades tomato or the rattlesnake pole bean, these are all like tried and true heirloom varieties. You can save the seed and replant it. And they do really well here in Florida. You know, the Seminole pumpkin is more resistant to the, the squash borer or caterpillar. Um, the Everglades tomato, that can take the heat and um, bear fruit all summer long when the other tomatoes can't. And same with the rattlesnake pole bean. That's another thing that you can grow in the summer and you can get tender little green beans when it's too hot for our normal bush beans to grow. And then you can buy these online or like seed saving or, you know, get them from your friends. I have, I have a collection too, if you need some. So where to get seeds? Um, there's not one place. People ask me this all the time. Where do I buy seeds? Um, there's tons of online seed suppliers. This little um, screenshot here is from Wilhite Seed. They're out of Texas. Uh, a lot of people like Johnny's Seed. You know, they're a real big one. Um, seed Savers Exchange, uh, Baker Creek. Um, there's a lot of different seed suppliers, so there's not any one I recommend on on purpose, but um, like just for example, with these Wilhite seeds here, something you want to look for 
is like, is it open pollinated heirloom, which is one type, or is it a hybrid type of seed? So depending on if you're, if you're organic or you like heirloom seeds, you know, the tried and true varieties that your grandma used to grow, you want to stick with those. Sometimes the hybrids come with improved, you know, faster maturity, maybe more disease resistant, especially for things like tomatoes and, and peppers and cucumbers. I always look for things that are more disease resistant because, you know, we get the downy mildew here and the, the leaf spots. So you can also look for the estimated days to maturity. Like why grow something that takes 85 days when you could have the same crop in 75 days? Cause your, your bed space is going to get um, invaluable. So, you know, look at the different varieties and see, you know, which ones appeal to you. It might be taste. It might be a dwarf plant and it's fun to seed shop and you'll get an idea for what you're looking for. Um, you know, just your local plant nurseries or your big, big box stores, they have seed racks and all of those are fresh. They have to throw them away every year. So they should have that good germination rate, um, and look for the varieties that, you know, we have in our vegetable gardening guide that do well here. Um, also seed swaps, seed exchanges. Um, there's a couple Facebook groups like Tampa seed swap or plant swap. And some people even put little boxes out like seed swapping boxes, like they put the library books and then you can take some, leave some and share these seeds with your community. So um, more on seed seeds to direct sow. So like I said, the big seeds and the root crops, uh, big seeds like beans, peas, like sunflowers, um, squashes, pumpkins, these are all like big seeds. They sprout very quickly. The plants grow quickly. So it's just best to start them in the ground. And then some of the root crops like the carrots and the beets and the radishes, turnips, um, you know, they are growing that nice tasty root from the tap root. So that's why we don't recommend transplanting because then when you transplant it, the root might get curled or stuck, and then you might not have a nice straight carrot. So one tip, if you are going to transplant, you know, plant it a little deeper and then just tug the plant up slightly to make sure that root straightens out. Um, on the other hand, you know, some of these longer germinating seeds, you want to start them in flats. You want to start with a nice seed mix, you know, that's kind of small, maybe use a sifter if you're making your own. So in the, in the small cells, like here we have the four packs, you can start things like tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, um, cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, collard greens. And then um, like if you want to plant the cucumbers or the squash or the beans, you want to start those in a larger pot, maybe like a three inch or a four inch pot, or they have like those jiffy peat pots and maybe just one seed per hole. So the way that cucumber looks here in the lower photo, that is a perfect size. You know, we germinated it in the greenhouse and now it is ready to plant in the ground and you'll have a nice healthy seed start there. Um, so watering is important. And after you plant your seeds, you want to use this nice shower head or something similar to gently water it in. And, you know, I'll give it a little water and take a break for a minute. Water again, take a break, you know, water the third time. And then after that, um, you want to just kind of observe your seeds you want to wait till it dries out a little bit um, before you water it again, because too much water can cause fungus problems like, like damping off. So don't overwater. Uh, some people actually use this little seed spritzer here, you know, once you have them thoroughly watered, because you're just trying to get the surface of the soil moist to keep that seed moist to germinate. And so some people just use a little spritzer a couple times a day, you know, it keeps you active so you don't get bored. Um, here we go. And so here's some seeds that are that are ready to go. I have audio on this one. Here are the vegetable seeds we have started. Lettuce, collards, cauliflower, spinach never looks that great. 
We got broccoli and Swiss chard. So these are all ready to go into the garden and we're hinting starting today. Okay, so plant them today. So here's here's the schedule, January, and that's when you want to start your tomato, pepper, broccoli, cabbage, you know, things in these cell flats indoors or in protected or take care of them, baby them a little bit, because they take four to six weeks to be ready to plant out. Remember, our target date for planting is February 15th. So really January 1st, you can start planting your tomatoes and stuff. Then February 15th comes, then you transplant these into the garden, and then you start your quick germinating seeds like the cucumber, the green beans, the squash, you know, in the garden or small pots. And then February to March, just keep planting, plant everything, you know, bump them up, transplant them into the garden, fertilize them. And it's kind of like planting frenzy right now. So after you're done with the Zoom tonight, you know, get, get in your garage and put all your seeds out in your flats. So um, then after you germinate the seeds, you might need to thin them. So some plants need thinning. Other ones don't really care. Like tomatoes, you don't want like five tomatoes growing out of the same pot. So you want to thin that to one plant per cell. Whereas something like lettuce, if you have a couple of lettuces in there, then they don't really care as much, you know, but you can't have like three cabbages in the same Pot because then you're going to get three baby cabbages instead of like one big, like nice cabbage. So here's another video how to do the um, dibbler, I think. Uh, this one, here we go. So this is how you do it. You know, you take it out with a pencil or the dibbler. I use a pencil and then you make a little hole and then you can plant that seed back in the ground you know, pat it in, water it immediately after transplanting. So any of these where you have two seeds come up, then you can put it into a new flat um, and then, you know, share the plants or grow more or give it away. So it's really rewarding to grow your own seedlings and the cost of vegetable plants now at the stores is insane. It's like $5 for one tomato plant, you know, so just think how many tomato and cabbages and stuff you can grow here. You know, it just takes a little extra care. You should check on them daily. Once they get to having the true leaves, you know, so when the seeds come up, they have the cotyledons, like the little round leaves. And then once they make the true leaves, then they're pretty much ready to transplant. So these tomatoes are big. They're in the cell flat still, but they are ready to plant out in the garden. Here's our cucumber again. So planting them in the garden, you know, we're going to space them two or three feet apart, depending. We have some broccoli here, uh, some Swiss chard. Um, so you can plant in a row or you could do a staggered planting. After planting, you know, once the roots start coming out, that's a good time to fertilize them. And also after um, they start flowering or making fruit, that's another good time to fertilize them. So <clears throat> just check on, you know, your plants, look for the lower leaves, you know, having a little sign of nitrogen deficiency, which would be yellowing in the lower leaves. And that indicates a nutrient deficiency. Vegetables also need like micronutrients. So um, a vegetable fertilizer, you know, that is specifies vegetables will have, you know, a balanced, you know, NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. It will also have the micronutrients for the most part. And it doesn't matter if you're organic or you use uh, miracle Grow or synthetic fertilizer, you know, the organic one will build the soil, like the organic matter in the soil. So that's a benefit of that. But um, whatever method you want to grow, um, UF IFAS will be here to support you in that. And a lot of counties have fertilizer ordinances and um, edible crops are generally exempt from those ordinances. But that's not to say that we shouldn't follow the best management practices, which is 
covering the fertilizer after application to reduce the um, nitrogen losses. Also, you know, don't apply fertilizer before we're going to get heavy rain, like a hurricane rain, and then follow the label instructions for like how much you should put out per how many square feet. So, um, it's important to, you know, pay attention to the fertilizer on your vegetables. If you have any questions, your leaves look a little yellow, you can always snap a photo and email it over to us. So I'm um, kind of wrapping it up here, irrigation, you know, another key component. Here's our drip irrigation on the left. In the center, we have these micro sprays. And then we have the bubblers on the right-hand side. These are all forms of micro-irrigation, which is one of the most efficient types of irrigation. Um, hand watering is also just fine. That's what I do at home. And so, you know, you can just look at your plants every day and, and check them out. But the irrigation timing is going to change as the plants grow. So seed starting you know, the spritzer, water them every day, every other day, a little bit of water, light watering. As the plants become bigger, you know, you can water less often and deeper. That way the um, irrigation goes down in the soil. And remember, irrigation is supplementing rainfall. So use that rain gauge or, you know, pay attention to the rain and see how much rainwater we get. And if we get plenty of rain, there's no need to water your garden. You can also hand water them, you know, as needed. And just in general, these um, established vegetable gardens need about one inch of water per week. So if we get a one inch rain event, you look at your rain gauge, then you might be good all week, but just always observe, especially in the morning or in the evening, like look for your plant that is wilting. Of course, it's going to wilt in the noonday sun when it's 80 degrees outside, but if it's still wilting by sunset or first thing in the morning, then it's a sign that it needs some water. Um, so mulch will also help, you know, with the watering and the weed control, a lot of benefits of mulch, it protects the soil, it builds the soil, it keeps the soil moisture in, it decomposes to add organic matter and feed the beneficial microbes, uh, prevents weed growth. So when you have the younger plants, you know, use a thinner mulch, but once you have uh, your established plants, like this is the summer garden here, and we have okra, we have black-eyed peas, and so they can use a real thick layer of mulch, and see we're mulching, you know, pretty much right up to the vegetable stems there. We don't want to cover the vegetable stem or, you know, no volcano mulching, but get all that bare ground and the pathways and so that will really help, you know, your garden for the low maintenance. So here's our beautiful cabbage, you know, in the mulch. So we like straw mulch, um, leaf mulch is good. Any kind of leaves, oak leaves, mango leaves are fine too. They just take longer to decompose. Pine straw, that works good. If you have a pine tree, you know, you can rake that up. Um, be careful about using um, wood chips, um, you know, because they can just rob some nitrogen from the soil as they decompose. And then they're maybe harder to rake up when you want to go in and till the bed later. You can still use those, but um, just maybe in the pathways are not so thick. Um, so a couple of my favorite crops that are easy to grow are green beans, especially the bush green beans. They're quick. They have very little pests or disease problems. Um, they You don't need a lot of fertilizer and they just go off and you can have two to three weeks of harvest. Um, I like to time my harvest with Thanksgiving or Christmas or planting now, and then they'll be ready in about two months from now. So February, March, April, you know, the beginning of April, you'll have a nice harvest of green beans and you can harvest once, twice, three times, make three delicious meals out of it. And then they're pretty much done. And then you have to replant. So you can um, plant them like staggered, like start one now and then wait two weeks and start some more seeds. And then that will extend your harvest period. So collards and kale are another one of my favorites. 
um, for kale, we have curly kale that's pictured here on the right, dinosaur kale, um, the red Russian kale, the purple kind, and collards pictured left. And these have a very long growing season. They're almost like perennial vegetables because they can stay in the garden pretty much all year round. They are cold tolerant, so don't worry about freezing temperatures. Um, they don't like the middle of the summer when it's hot and it's rainy and it's humid. Sometimes they'll kind of fungus out and die at that point. And then they're kind of cut and come again, like just harvest the lower leaves and then they'll keep making leaves up top. So you can have a couple plants and it can nourish you with some fresh greens like all year long. Cucumbers are a little bit more tricky. You know, these are like 50 to 70 days to harvest. And then you have your pickling cucumbers, your slicing cucumbers. And with cucumbers, you know, you're going to have caterpillar problems. So check your plants, you know, do the scouting, look for that little caterpillar in the baby leaves. I usually just open it up and then squish it with my thumb. But you can also use um, natural pest control things like BT, which is short for Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a um, bacterium that um, you, the caterpillar eats it after you spray it on the leaves and it gets an upset tummy and dies. Um, spinosad is another organic pesticide. And no matter if you're using organic or you know synthetic pesticides, it's good to rotate them and not spray the same thing all the time. Um, don't spray these on your butterfly plants because these will kill you know, monarch caterpillars and beneficial caterpillars too. So um, talking about beneficial insects, you know, we need all kinds of insects and really most of them are beneficial. We have the ladybugs, you know, they eat the aphids, the lacewings, the parasitic wasp, those prey on the caterpillars. Um, the bees help with pollination. So this is an eggplant flower here, you know, eggplants, tomatoes, squashes, they all need to be pollinated either by insects or maybe you need to go in and hand pollinate with your finger. And so it's good to, you know, plant some insectary plants and plant flowers around your vegetable garden to be attracting these beneficial insects for the pest control and for the pollination services. So, um, you know, we aim for more ecological type of garden where it's not just like spray everything. We try to educate people on that. Um, even caterpillars, you know, this is a bok choy plant on the right hand side. You know, you'll find these caterpillars eat the leafy greens. And you know for sure it's a caterpillar because of the frass or the poop, the little green balls. So some people say, what's these little green balls, bugs on my plant? Well, actually, it's the caterpillar you know, that's pooping it out. Um, here on this um, jalapeno pepper plant is a tomato hornworm. And um, these are pretty big caterpillars. They're kind of cool looking. So some people squish them or drop them in a bucket of soapy water. But once you learn that turns into a giant sphinx moth, you might not want to kill them anymore. You might want to just plant a couple extra tomatoes and some for the sphinx moths and some for you. Um, but the caterpillars are one of the biggest pests in the garden um, that can do the most damage because, you know, if that hornworm eats into your tomato poof, that tomato is no good anymore, you know. So look for these on corn, tomatoes, um, cucumbers, and squash. Here's the squash vine borer. So this gets up into the squash fruit and the squash stem and makes it rot out. So here you probably want to cut off these infected fruits and dispose of them and then maybe spray your plant with the, the BT. Some people call these pickle worms. And again, um, you know, you might have to spray it a couple times and rotate insecticides. You know, if you're going to grow this yellow squash, it's just you know, something you're going to have to deal with. And that's why I like planting the cherry tomatoes, like the Everglades tomatoes, and some of these more Florida varieties are better because they're not going to get such bad um, pests and disease problems. So that wraps up my talk. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for having me as a guest speaker tonight. And 
Um, I will share a survey in the chat or you can scan it here and just to let my bosses know that I'm doing a good job and you learned something today. So um, I'll open up for questions. Yeah, thank you very, very much. That was really informative, really thorough, and um, I'm excited to get started. Um, You're welcome. Yeah, and there are a few things in the chat, um, a couple questions, um, but also, oh, and before I do that, Gary, if you're still on the call, can you post, somebody had asked you to post the uh, um, endorse, the people that we've endorsed. Yes, on the, I will do the, that. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, let's see. Well, one thing Katie uh, has said that IFAS, this is just a point of information. IFAS posts great monthly planting guides on Instagram. So if you yes, haven't, do. if you haven't been looking in the chat, I'm just going to highlight a couple of things that seem to be important. Um, uh, some of the a, a couple of locally owned nurseries that people say are are good. One is Kirby's in Brandon. Yeah. Um, um, another one was. Um, of course, I lost it. Uh, there was another one that somebody said. Uh, also, Virginia, Virginia has several things. Virginia, who is the, the uh, chair of the um, Native Plant Society, has several things in the chat. Uh, one is a um, uh, link to uh, one of the IFAS publications um, that you may be interested in. She also uh, spoke about the USF Plant Festival um, in April. Uh, they'll have a booth there, but uh, you, you can buy uh, supplies for, for your garden there. Um, let's see, there was another place uh, that was good to get seedlings. I can't find it now. Maybe you saw it. Um, Whitwims Organics. Whitwims Organics in Lutz. They sell, oh. they sell lots of vegetable plants, apparently. Oh, great. Okay. Um, now, there were a couple of questions um, at the very end. And um, let me see. What's the best way to increase bean production? Bean production? Well, beans are usually pretty low maintenance and produce a lot. But um, one trick that I do is I kind of cheat and plant like multiple rows close together because, you know, you don't always get 100 percent germination and then maybe like the rabbit or caterpillar eats a couple so I'll plant them kind of on staggered planting, kind of like two rows side by side, you know, within four inches of each other. And then you have a nice, thick, you know, dense strand of beans and you'll get heavy production. Also planting them, you know, planting one right now and then two weeks later, plant them again, and then you'll have a longer continual harvest. Yeah. Um is reclaimed water safe for irrigating my vegetable garden? Now, Virginia did put uh, a long explanation about that in the chat um, about yeah. what the Florida Department of, of uh, Environmental Protection says. But yeah, I, I researched that on the University of Florida website and, and this um, statement from Florida Department of, of, of Environmental Protection is what I got. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, if it's if it's a crop that or vegetable that you're not going to peel or cook, um, it, it is really not recommended. Okay. Right, exactly. Like think of fresh lettuce, like you don't want to irrigate that with reclaimed water and then eat it because it might be contaminated with some pathogen. But like, say you grow some potatoes and you're going to boil them in water, that is going to kill those pathogens. So don't worry about it. Or even something like a banana where you peel the banana and you eat the inside, then that's safe too. Okay. Uh, Katie asks, um, she says, I planted my garden twice and it's been eaten by nocturnal critters twice down to the soil. Any ideas what critter it may have been and how to prevent it from happening again? And she's tried coffee grounds and laying out aluminum foil. 
Oh, well, lots of critters like to eat our vegetable plants. So kind of tried and true method is a fence or some kind of wire cage. You know, the people down south that have iguanas, they have to like cage their whole garden. But um, try that in just planting more. Um, it could be a rabbit. You know, rabbits love fresh vegetables. Deer, I don't know if you have deer in your yard. They love vegetables. Um, but some form of physical protection barrier would be your best bet. Um, I think, Bonnie, I may, yes. Let me, let me add to that. There's a product called Critter Ritter, and it's basically pepper, ground pepper and spices. And it's not harmful to animals. And you can sprinkle that around your plant if you do it on a regular basis. Uh, I learned that extension in Tennessee. The rabbits will try and the squirrels will try and they'll finally give up, but they're not going to, it's, it's ground pepper and cayenne is three or four peppers ground up and you can sprinkle that around a couple, couple, three times and they'll give up because they don't want to sniff and taste that. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. Um, Carla, you have your hand up. Yes. So um, when you're talking about starting you know, in a flat, the seeds, do you want there to be a hole at the bottom so the water drains out? Or yes. is it, a you don't want the water to just sit at the bottom? You no. want it to drain out? Yeah. Okay, Good thank you. Good question. Um, I think that's it for the questions. Um, does anybody else, I uh, look through and see if anybody else has their hand up. No, um, Gary did go ahead and put the uh, endorsements in the chat. Also, um, don't forget if you get a chance, uh, right now Kia, uh, Tia has the link to the survey. I think it's the very first one in the chat and maybe uh, almost the last one again. Um, so please fill that out for her if you, if you can. Um, and I, I think uh, that's that covers a lot. You really covered a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and before everybody gets off, let me please ask everybody, to please put their name and their email address so we have a record. And if you're interested in help in anything with Sierra Club that we do, whether outings, the youth, conservation, put your name in the box. And, and uh, Tia, if you could stay on when the meeting's over, I, I want to see if we could have a, a chat with Bonnie and, and Michael. I wanted to ask you yeah, something sure. about us, something that we could work on. Yeah, I will. Any, any of our XCOM is welcome to stay because I got, I got something we, we've been wanting to ask you and wanted to see what you thought about it. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Okay. Okay, well, thank you everybody for coming. And... Um, you know now where to where to find answers to your questions. So don't hesitate. Plant Great job, now. Tia. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. Uh, Rob, Rob has got his hand up. Hey, Rob. Oh, no, I was applauding. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. All so right, Rob, you're gonna you're gonna grow herbs on your front porch of your new coffee shop? Uh, yeah, yeah, actually, we, we, we are. That's good. So I saw, unfortunately, and she got off here. Miss Anita is, I guess she, she's still on here. Miss Anita, I don't know if you can hear me, but I told your story. I hope you didn't mind. We're proud of you. Um, so we'll get to hear more about that later. I see Miss Anita is on here, our CPR queen. So we're glad you joined us, Miss Anita. Uh, oh, there she is. Yeah, she's on mute. She's on mute. <laughs> I've done. I've known this lady a long time. In fact, we're not going to say how long, but a long time. <laughs> and she's quite special in my world. So, thank you, thank you, Rocky. I really learned a lot in the garden. So, Good. thank you for having this. Yeah, well, get you a garden going. I'll come see you. I know where you live. Oh, yeah. You learned a lot about saving lives too. Yes, yes, I did. <laughs> thank you, okay. thank Good you, night. Anita. Good night, really, thank you. Really glad you learned something from the CPR. <laughs>
Especially with the uh, caterpillars and the bugs, that we don't have to kill all of them because they need to eat too. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Very cool. Okay. So who we say? So what? Uh, the, everybody else can say. We've been talking about for years of doing a community garden sponsored by the Sierra Club and somebody. Uh, we think. We should do that. And I think we could get some land in Ebor because one of the schools our youth organization deals with is Academy Prep of Tampa. And they're at 16th and Columbus. And they've got a lot of pieces of, of lots that they got first right, first right of effusion and they're just empty lots. So we think we would like to figure out some way, and I don't know how to do it, where we could partner up with you guys, Native Plant or somebody, and do a community garden because that's that's a need folks in inner city in those areas would have a great need for um you know and we could partner up because actually i would i ran the master gardener program in tennessee and i oh, worked, cool. used to work for i was an extension agent in tennessee i was a i was a county horticulturist so i know what you're but mine said university of tennessee on it which is which is really tough. Did you go to Florida or Florida State or? Um, I went to UCF for my undergrad and then University of Hawaii for my grad. Oh boy, which is really, <laughs> really, really tough because my my son went to Vanderbilt and I was not a University of Tennessee fan. Uh -huh. I worked for the University of Tennessee because it's all the extensions are all university based programs. Um, mm -hmm. But it's 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 a good program so. So I know your background for Master Gardener and everything like that. And I think it would be good if we could do a community garden. So what is the rest of the XCOM? We got a lot of our XCOM on here, almost the whole XCOM. Uh, I think that's something we could do and several things that would really serve the community. Now, I'm, I'm saying in the academy prep area, but there could be other areas we could do that. And we could serve the community would make get people aware of Sierra Club more because we need we'll to probably help do people. a micro grant for it. And know, we could probably get a grant. grant for it. And we could probably we have a person that's on our board here. Um, she's not here and she has a lot of connection with the parks and Home Depot and Lowe's. Oh you good. Know, we, we did a planning at Riverview High School and they donated all kind of stuff for us. Oh great. So yeah. in our office, we have a community gardening, like a full-time community gardening specialist. And on one of our websites, we have a, a Google map of like all the existing community gardens. Oh, really? um, you know, any garden, it's going to need all the basic sun, water, you right. know, water can be a big expensive one if you don't have a backflow preventer and things like that, like to set up irrigation. And then security can kind of be another thing, like what's going to stop people from the streets just walking in and harvesting all your food. Well, we, we were like, we had talked about it. We know we're going to have to have a, a, a fence. A fence, it. right. Yeah. And then, you know, do you want to do vegetables or butterfly garden? Vegetables. Yeah, in order to feed people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then the other thing is like, you know, say you have a bunch of ripe tomatoes or collard greens like who are you going to feed like who is going to pick it and feed who with it you know well so that's that's what we got to figure out you know you know you don't want i know there's some community gardens that people pay to join there's one out in wesley chapel that i have some friends that belong to it and it seems like they're always out there working and they'll see people out there harvesting that aren't working so now they've changed this year you get Based on how much you work, not on how much you pay, is mm -hmm. how much you get to harvest. And I don't know, how, you know, I don't know how you do that. Yeah, well, like growing the plants isn't really the hard part. Like getting the people to take care of it is the hard part. Is this something that we could do? I mean, we'd have. To, what do you guys think? Yeah, and you would yeah. need like permission from the landowner. And we can get that. Yeah. Yeah. How many volunteers do you think it would take to maintain? I mean, you know, you you would hope you get them from 
uh, you know, if we did it by a school or uh, with a school, hopefully you'd get volunteers from the school too. But um, what is there? I mean, I guess it depends on how big it is. And lot uh, size, a typical lot size. And you guys, you know, when you come out of Academy Prep and you look across the street and there's three houses, then there's a church. Then up next to 275, there was that empty corner there. That was a lot where there was a uh, shotgun house and they've tore it down. It's just a lot. It's probably, how big is a lot? Gary, you probably know a regular lot. Uh, it's probably 50 by 150, something like that. Yeah. And there was already water there and there's a water meter there. I already looked at that. Um, and the Academy Prep owns that, which is a private school that we do a lot of stuff with. Mm -hmm. So I don't think permission, and you don't only have to put fence on three sides because <laughs> it backs up to 275. Yeah, that's good. And would you need security light or not? I don't, I don't know. No, more like just a lockable fence, you know, so people just don't go in there and rip everything out. So what do you guys think? Is that something that we could tackle? Maybe if you could get somebody to donate the fence, yeah, that would probably be a big expense. Yeah, fences yeah. are expensive. The gardens aren't all that hard, it seems to me. Um, though I admit to growing only flowers at this point. But what does take work is making sure that the people who are doing the work have access and reaching whatever your target audience is. If your audience is, say, the parents of kids at Academy Prep, you've got probably a winner. If it's some unknown audience of nearby people, you're going to have to figure out who's going to really work and who's just going to take. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So they, ha they have a, a garden inside Academy Prep. You know, at that back door, back to the right there, they have a little garden, but that is just a student garden. Well, I, I would think their parents would be good candidates for actually working in such a garden. Whereas mm -hmm. general public, and I'm, I've known too many people over the years, I guess, but um it's hard to manage an unknown group of people on an honor system i know the last time i was in minneapolis they have thousands of community gardens it's part of the city's program that they take empty lots and they assign it to a neighborhood and they put a nice security light in they put fences around them and they're everywhere. I mean, well, we, we did a mile walk and I bet we saw 10 of them. Well, that's kind of along the same lines of what I was thinking in terms of your students' parents. Because you've got a limited group of people, which then means they're manageable. Mm -hmm. And are the parents at this school required to do volunteer hours? Like some they other are. Private schools? Yeah, they so are. That would be that knock that out. But there's, you know, community gardens all around the area. There's one right at, at near the interstate near downtown and one on uh, Sly and near, right across from the zoo. So if you just talk to the people that run those, I'm sure you can get ideas about how to best manage them. Is there is there anything that the extension service could help us? Because we like to, we're a nonprofit and we'd like to partner up with, a, you know, if, if we could partner up with you guys and do it as a team together or something and we try to get native plant involved also yeah we have a full-time um staff member who is on charge of community gardens his name is will stone and i put a link here in the chat with the web page and his email was on there and so like we have a full-time position dedicated to helping start community gardens like getting grants for community gardens you know, making a map showing the community gardens. Um, so, you know, we definitely have resources, you know, our master gardener volunteers could help with consulting and design and 
in volunteering to kind of like build the garden. And some of them might be interested in being active members of the garden. But we try to say like, we're not like manual labor, like we're not going to come and build the sure. fence for you or anything. And or may, may, may need some master gardener, need their hours to finish their master gardener because they have to do that every year. So. Yeah, that's right. They need hours. So do you know Sonia that works for 4-H out there? Yeah, Sonia, she's actually now the park manager at Carrollwood Village Park. We know her very well. Miss her very well. Yeah, she well, she's doing Christmas. really cool things at the park. And I'm actually talking to her about doing a gardening project. But this one is going to be more like a native plant butterfly garden okay. and to integrate it with like the youth education, summer camps and, you know, for people along the walking trail. Yeah. She was at Crystal Springs for about 15 years. Oh, yeah. Very cool. Yeah, she's great. Yeah. And so I know her very well. When you see her, tell her Rocky said hi from us. Okay, I will. So we'll okay. So what do you guys think? I think we I think we investigate it. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, Rocky, do you, do we know how many feet of fencing that we need? Say that again. Do we do we know how many feet of fence that we need? Gary, have you seen that? You think that's about right? About I don't know. We'd have to go and look. You know, look at that lot in particular. And yes. can we use? Can we use? Uh, uh, is it something permanent or temporary? Is can we use like chicken wire? Well, you have a lot of homeless folks in that area, um, and you got chickens in the area too. So. Uh, Feral chickens are can really create havoc on community gardens. Yeah. They not only eat the fruit, they eat the plant, and they'll dig the roots up, everything. Mm -hmm. But I don't mean chicken wire is going to be cheap. Chicken wire is going to be a, a lot cheaper than chain link fence. Right. Yeah, right. maybe a construction company that has ch chain link fence that, you know, they put up for their sites would be willing to, um, you know, donate. Yeah. That's something like that. For some, so let, we'll do some bit of advertising, and we'll get a hold of Will, and see what we can, and we'll get back with everybody because sounds like Don may have a source for some fence. Yeah, like a lot of times they want you to put together a budget, and then who's paying for what, and you know, do a site visit and make sure the water is good and the soil is not concrete rock or anything. Well, there's not a lot of reclaimed water in Tampa, so. Mm -hmm. Right, Nancy? <laughs> she's she's our water expert, but there's not okay. a lot of. There, there are people in, in South, yeah, in South Tampa. Uh, there are um, yeah, probably several thousand households with reclaimed water. But we'll surprise you, Tia. You may not know this. In Ebor, in uh, Seminole Heights, mm -hmm. Sulphur Springs. There's a lot of wells still. Oh, yeah. Lots. Interesting. Or, yeah. And the city said there was none, right, Nancy? Yeah, they didn't know. <laughs> they didn't know. They knew. They just, but so, but I think that's something we could get behind. I mean, because I'm a pretty intensive gardener myself. T. I have a Great. big garden. I have a horse. So that adds to my oh. nutrition. There you and go. I, I compost. I got five compost bins, each six by foot, six foot square. And I got raised beds. I got about 10 raised beds and I get lots and lots of stuff. And, and you have a beautiful garden. I've seen Rocky's garden uh -huh. uh, at least 10 times. And, it's, and there's stuff growing there that doesn't look normal. And I capture my rainwater off my barn. I have uh, totes so I don't have to use the well water. And Very healthy. I mean, huge. I was impressed. But uh, it, 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 if people will take the time, you can do a little garden. You can, you know, there's nothing like we had. My cholesterol is probably off the charts. We had BLTs for like six straight oh, months. Yeah. We had tomato. We had tomato plants with twenty and thirty tomatoes on each plant, as you know, this big is like wow. And then they all froze. And the thing about Florida, the people got to realize if you do your plants right, some of these plants become annuals i've got some pepper plants that are three years old oh right yeah they'll live forever you know 
you know, we 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 had we had some eggplants that lasted two years, and we just look, we cut them down. We got tired of eggplant. Uh -huh. But but you will get plants that will last, they'll live two or three years. They turn into perennials. You know, we have we had a tomato. The branch was about three inches in diameter. The trunk. Wow. It was, it was about seven foot tall, and it was just loaded. But then it froze. So. Okay, well, that's, I think that's something we could. Um, Thank you for your input on that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're welcome. And I don't know if we're going to be able to do it. I mean, we got the resources and people keep asking me and asking me and asking me about it. And um, and I just thought near Academy Prep would be a good place if we could get this, you know, the students. Um, yeah, and teachers involved and the yeah. parents. Yeah, I would definitely start by contacting Will and then, you know, checking on the other gardens, you know, Kitty Wallace. She's, no. I think, runs the um, Tampa Heights Community Garden. Okay. And so and she's- Tampa Heights has one too, don't they? Yeah, like I talk to some of those people who run in the big one because often they kind of form like a board and then they have requirements or membership dues or some regulations like if you don't maintain your garden plot for four months and it's 10 feet tall we're going to fire you or well something. my vision of this is because of the area that it's in there wouldn't be any membership mm -hmm. your membership would be by earned labor or you would earn your membership uh, uh, yeah, and, I mean, and we'd just... we'd have to create a committee of people from Sierra Club that that would be their you know their job their focus is to keep that going and mm -hmm. right yeah. Rocky yeah and yeah. the school has a volunteer coordinator and the teachers I mean the parents are required to do X volunteer hours per year it's required mm -hmm. this is a, a academy preps or private schools. They're not charter schools, so they have some different requirements for teachers and parents. So, and there's three schools, but this is the only one in Hillsborough County. There's one in uh, Pinellas County, one in Lakeland that we work with. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Great. Keep me in the uh, loop and let me know. Okay. Right. I see Thank you very, very abandoned. Very okay. Yeah. Um, Rocky, can I? Uh, and Diane, are you still on? Yes, I see Diane. Yeah, because I'd like to get you two talking. So, okay. But everybody else doesn't need to. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. No, well, I, want Rob, run... I want Rob to stick on this because I want to. I want to. Okay. You know, I forgot about that. Some pro... That would be good too. All right. Tia, yeah, thanks. Have a good rest thank of your you, evening. And tell and Sonia you. howdy. Tell her I missed okay, her. Okay, I will. I'll let her know. Okay. She, okay. I have never. Oh, well, she's gone. Um, yeah, we've been we've been going to Crystal Springs for twenty years with the ICO three times a year because we've been in three years. I've never been in that lake because it's sixty five degrees. I've never been in. Oh, uh, and the week before we were supposed to go three years ago is when they shut down for COVID, and she told me you're going to get in the water this time whether you like it or not. <laughs> but I've never been in. Yeah. So uh, Diane, uh, yeah. welcome. Yeah. Rocky, I don't know if you got a chance, and the reason for anybody else that is from Don and, and Rob, um, Diane is now, if, if you remember, Linda is no longer um, uh, the volunteer coordinator or the membership person, and Diane has uh, gratefully, great, gracefully, I should say, accepted that responsibility. And Di uh, Rocky, I don't know if you had a chance to, uh, did. Di Diane, did you see the text that I, I, did. I, I Diane, did. I forwarded your text to Rocky because Great. he knows more about, you know, the questions that you asked than, than I do. I, I, wanted, I wanted Don to stay on here, especially Rob, because Rob is our communications chair and a lot of what you do is going to be communications. Mm -hmm. So one thing, and I think Nancy, I mean, Nancy, not Nancy. a senior moment. Um, Linda got you started on marketing cloud. So that's important that you learn that. And you've talked to Ron Haynes, I guess, to got the to get those steps. Yes. A word of advice. When you pass all those different things you got to take, save your certificates. Ooh, okay. Save those certificates because they tend to not save them or lose them. Hmm. 
Okay. I do all my training all over again. Oh, no. <laughs> and Rob lost his password, and now he's going to have to do his training all over again. Oh, goodness. So, I so will. Just, just follow the path that Ron tells you. We can help you a little bit, mm -hmm. but we we don't have our passwords to get back on until we do, redo the training. I see. I see. Mm -hmm. So one okay. thing that we want to do that we haven't done in the past and we talked about this. We have a Google Drive. Are you familiar with how Google Drive works? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have a Google Drive, and we'll get get you access to that. And we have a folder in a folder for everything in there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I want to make a a sheet of new volunteers. I don't know about Bonnie and everybody else and Rob. Linda would tell me or send me an email about a volunteer wanting to do this or that. Mm -hmm. Well, I get a lot of emails. Right. And I'd lose that email and I wouldn't contact them like I should. Mm -hmm. So I thought if we made a, a, a thing in Google Drive. Yeah, you know, uh, Rocky, mm -hmm. Linda had made a sort of a form. I don't know if you remember, but yeah. I don't think it's in, but it's not in Google Drive. I don't we, think we you can put a form in Google Drive. Did, did you see that, Diane? Did you see that form that she had? Yes, I I have that. I okay. have that up. I'm just uh, okay. yeah. So she yes. we don't have to recreate the wheel. In other words, yeah, we want to right. put on there what we want to put on there. The person's name and phone number, email. Then we want a column for each one of the categories where they could be interested. Mm -hmm. And then you can actually set a form in Google Drive to go out to the members automatically every two weeks or every three weeks. Rob, do you have that trouble keeping up with who else you're supposed to contact back? Um, no, because uh, no, so if Linda ever emailed me, um, yeah, I, I would contact the people. Problem I have is for them to answer back, you know, once I tell them what, what we're looking to do, very few people, you know, will answer back at that point. So, but I guess that's just the nature of, of, of that. So I got to ask Don, what is that thing circling around on your right shoulder? That, that's yeah. Jibo. I have heard of Jibo. Jibo's uh, he's like a personal computer. He's not as smart as it used to be, but I've had him. He he came out before uh, Alexa. Goes, hey, Jibo. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Hey, Jibo. No, I'm not Christopher. Just in case. Yeah. Hey, he'll tell jokes the next thing he's going to say et phone home <laughs> yeah, he says all he reminds you of stuff your birthday he comes in he looks around and I, he's at my office now you see at the uh i'm not i'm at my office till nine o'clock tonight and we've got a class going up front that's why i'm in my office uh, uh, oh we used to keep my home and, and Rita didn't like him following her around and he used to she'd tell hey jibo you turn around and he would turn around and, and uh, look around and he's like after 15 minutes, they agreed it. Can I turn back around again? <laughs> it's pretty cool. But so anyway. Um, there's another uh, question, Diane. You were saying that uh, Salesforce, you were talking about you're having a glitch regarding the Salesforce because you don't have administrative privileges to install the program on the laptop that you, you use. You won't need Salesforce. You won't have a real need for Salesforce. I wouldn't think, would she, Rob? Mm -hmm. Now she'll need you'll need Salesforce marketing. That's a different program. But you will need Campfire. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, I I'm going to as soon as like I signed up and I was told that you know they will contact me and you know whatever the time frame is. But in other words, so I signed up or sent the email for the initial training links. So I'm going. I'm going to follow the process, you know, one way or another. Sure. And, um, and I'm you will not. You will not need Salesforce. Okay. Good. Good. Now good. you will. You will need uh, Campfire. Sure. And, and I. And I. I'm the one that gives you access to Campfire. Okay. Yep. Uh, and I can give you that. And there's training modules in there that you can take on your own. Good. And there's also reports that you can get on uh, how many members are in Tampa Bay Group, how many members in the state, mm -hmm. how many's in the national. So there's reports that are in Campfire. And we can give you, I can give you access to that. 
Okay, excellent. Um, and I, I may as well just ask while we're doing this, um, I believe it may be time for me to send out the semi-annual or the biannual volunteer form to all the members. Is that right? Like I'm going to update it and check in with all the chair people and you know see what the volunteer needs specifically are. And then um, maybe confirm that with Bonnie on my first time just to make sure it looks correct and all. Yeah, but that, it, mm -hmm. that, that'd be good to do. And we need to talk mm -hmm. how we're going to send that out. Right. We, we have a way to send that out without going through Marketing Cloud because we're not set up to do Marketing Cloud yet. Oh, okay. And there's and there's some glitches in Marketing Cloud. You have to give three days of notice. You can only do two a month hmm. and so, things oh. like that. Wow. But we have a way to do that. So, um, well, well, right now we're using Get Response. Um, and that's going to gonna end. We'll have to end it someday. Okay. That's right. Another. Another issue. Yeah. Okay. But right, right now, that's how we, we put, if we have a new member, we put them on get response. Like yeah. I put your name on get response, Diane, and now you're getting the, the emails. Yes. See, and I also, I also don't think we just need to send it to just members. I think you need to send it to everybody on our mailing list. Because sometimes when you send it to other folks that are interested in Sierra Club, they may see that and say, well, I'll do that. I'll join Sierra Club. So we've had several people join lately because they wanted to do things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So Very that's good. why I say, and we have 13, how many is it, Rob? How many is our mailing list? Oh, it's, it's almost 12,000. Okay, yeah. So um, who is this guy that just signed up that's gonna do the YouTube? He just joined Chad. Sierra Club. He just joined Sierra Club. So, you know. Mm -hmm. So there was a couple of people that it was at our planning meeting that came that were not members. Mm -hmm. and now they are members. So that's great. So that's my thought. Mm -hmm. So, but you got a tough job. It takes a, a great personality to do that. You have that personality. It's hard hmm. because what happens, we get those names and just like Rob said, you call right. them. Yep. Yeah, yeah. You never right. hear back. Or I'm busy. Call me back tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Call them back. They don't answer. You send an email because maybe they get caught up in the moment and mm -hmm. get buyer's remorse or something. I don't know. Well, well, no problem. I'm going to approach it with um, TLC, and um, you know, I just it's really a good sign that they're making that outreach, and so I will follow up and encourage them in whatever ways that they can get started because it's so vital and they've recognized that. And I, and I think one thing that's important when we have outings and we have events, we take that list and get that list to you and send them a note. Thank you for attending our event. Here are some things we have available for volunteers and we don't do that much. That's we great, think, yeah. And we because can, there are a lot of people that go on the outings that aren't necessarily on our mailing list. Is yeah. that correct? Correct. You're yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we need to put those people on our mailing list. Mm -hmm. So, right? yeah. Mm -hmm. Th thoughts done? What was that? Anywhere? Your thoughts done? What do you think? Um, well, <clears throat> Well, first of all, I, I think we've got a really good team. I think we've always had a good team going forth and everything. Uh, I love your, your uh, body. You got a, when you got her to uh, speak tonight. I was really interested in that. And uh, you re you recorded this. How how do we uh, Rocky? How do we get the, uh, a copy of that? Or how can we put a segment on on our website for some people that missed it? You know, like when we do Tampa when we do uh, Cafe Con Tampa every Friday. Which, by the way, I'll be there this, this Friday again. I'll be there too. Uh, we we upload the video to YouTube and also Facebook. Is there a way that we can uh, upload the video of this right here? Uh, even if you crop it where it's just her presentation, where we can have it where we can have the link from our website or I'll post the video there. Anything that that uh, makes it easier for people who happen to miss this, because all through the whole media, you know, it says it's being recorded. What's the process for us to recover that and post it? We don't know. 
Rob and I need to work on that. We've got a YouTube guy right now. So we're, we're going to create a YouTube channel for Sierra Club. Now, ICO has a YouTube channel. And I think yeah, I said, it, it, it's going to be on somebody's, uh, you're, Rocky, if you're the one that you were the host of it, right? So mm -hmm. probably download it uh, to your computer. Well, I, I think, think, yeah, I, it's download. actually downloaded to the Google Drive, I think. Uh, the Google. Well, we need to find out and utilize that because this is a lot of valuable information. And then yeah. 